Apparently, I grew up in the wrong neighborhood. Now, I know this for a fact because of one particularly terrifying evening. Um, my mom, her name is Laura Emily, and us four children, of which I was the oldest, two younger brothers, younger sister, were all just huddled around, cuddling and you know, on the sofa and on the floor and just watching TV. But as we were sitting there, as we were lying around, feeling perfectly safe uh, with our mother, suddenly out of nowhere, the windows in our house, the front windows, just began to shatter and we could hear the gunfire. We were immediately thrust to the ground by our mom. I remember her arms slapping down heavy on me and her laying her body over her children. We were experiencing something. We were literally watching TV in a war zone. Now, this particular war zone was Los Angeles, California in the 1970s, the early 1970s, where I was a kid growing up in a situation where we were in a neighborhood where there were gangs that were fighting over the neighborhood as a territory that they were laying claim to. It was an extremely scary experience, and it happened more than once. We weren't the specific particular target of this, what they call drive-by shooting. We were simply there in the neighborhood as the gangs were flexing their muscle and laying claim to territory. Now, I've tracked with this over the years, and I've realized that we're living ourselves, all of us, not just me and the world I grew up in, but all of us are living in a war zone. And the alternative community that is the church specifically exists in the midst of a cosmic turf war, sometimes called the great controversy between good and evil. So I want to talk to you about turf wars this morning as relates to the identity and mission of the church in any given community and the church in the world as a whole. Over the years, a lot of reports have come out of Los Angeles indicating that essentially this is what it looks like. This is where I grew up. Um, last year, this article was published by a local news agency that has kind of a national reach, and that's how I came across the article. Um, and the title of the article, Gang Borders Create Invisible Walls in Los Angeles. Invisible walls. These walls are invisible because those who are living in these neighborhoods, my family um, in particular, I'm familiar with, didn't realize that we had moved into a neighborhood where there was red and there was blue. And we're not talking here about the Democratic and Republican parties. We're talking here about the two major gangs that came into existence in the early 1970s in Los Angeles, the Bloods and the Crips. There are, according to this particular map, 270 gangs in Los Angeles um, where I was raised. The article goes on to tell us graphically to describe what it's like to live in Los Angeles. The boundaries that mark gang territory are invisible but are known to people who live in those communities because going to the wrong gas station or shopping mall could mean life or death. I remember as a kid growing up, one particular incident in which my mother with her tip, she was a single mom as a, a waitress and she was raising us kids in that city and we pulled up to a grocery store in a particular neighborhood. My mother got out of the car on one side, we kids started piling out on the other side and just as she got out of the car and was headed for the grocery store, she was jumped by two men who wanted her purse. And as they were trying to wrestle her purse out of her arm, and she knew that that's the only money she had with the tips to feed her children, my mom screaming and yelling and kicking looked like a gang member herself. She was a rough, rough lady. And she meant business holding on to that purse. That was the neighborhood. That was the neighborhood. And there were invisible boundaries, and they were all around us. 
and we had to figure out where we could go, where we couldn't go, which stores we could go to, which stores we could not go to, which gas stations we could go to with the higher percentage of chance that we wouldn't be carjacked. This is what the article is describing. In Los Angeles, streets, freeways, train tracks, and the LA River form boundaries, notice the language, boundaries that many of us aren't aware of. These are the boundaries of gang territories. Back in the 1970s through the 90s, just wearing red or blue was contentious. It could have made you a target because those were the primary colors of the two dominant gangs at the time and still to this day, in fact. The colors were and still are in some parts of LA, flags of the Crips and Bloods, LA's two dominant gangs. Things have cooled down a bit, but check this out, because of gang injunctions and safety zones. In other words, the city has taken action to create safe zones in the city. And, and those who live there, and I grew up there, you began to pay attention to what the police were telling you. Hey, shop in this area, but definitely don't go over there and safe zones were created. And some of the action has moved off the street and gone online. The Crips and the Bloods have become, and many other gangs now, uh, corporate America in some sense. They've gone corporate, they've gone online, and they are companies, and they have employees, and they have benefit time, and vacation time, and it's really gone quite high tech. But there are still certain parts of LA where gang borders form invisible walls that delineate who goes where and who does what. Without clear markings, many LA residents don't even know where the barriers exist. That was us. But these boundary lines are there and they carry a lot of weight for the residents who live there among them, these invisible boundaries, these lines, where are they? Who has control of what neighborhoods and what areas? Those were questions that were foremost on our minds as we were coming up in Los Angeles. So I'm gonna to suggest to you this morning that we're physical beings that occupy physical space. Well, that's no wonder. That's not rocket science. We know we're physical and we know we're occupying physical space right now. But there are implications to the fact that we are physical beings that occupy physical space. Right out of the gate, the physicality of human nature and planet Earth indicates that we as human beings live in a territorial warfare that's going on and we are, in fact, territorial beings. We are creatures who are conscious of domains. Your home is a domain, in fact, and you have locks on the doors and on the windows because you feel that this is a place over which you have jurisdiction. You have the ability to exercise control within these four walls of this house in which you live or this piece of property on which you operate. And there's only one law, according to the biblical narrative, one law that allows people to occupy the same territory together without disputing ownership, and that law is the law of love. Now, just think about it for a minute. Human beings who are fallen and self-centered are going to engage in land grabs, are going to engage in territorial disputes. And this is an integral part of the biblical storyline. Throughout scripture, we see over and over again that land is extremely important. And land itself is constantly under dispute within scripture. And ultimately, the earth itself as a whole is under dispute in the larger scheme of the great controversy. Human beings cannot occupy the same space without war unless war is displaced by love. Only in sharing the space that we occupy with benevolence and kindness and deferring with humility to the others that share that space, can human beings possibly coexist without pain and anger and war? 
Now, the biblical narrative I have suggested to you, which begins in Genesis chapters 1 through 3, is very much centered on this idea of territory. When the biblical story begins to unfold to us, we're told, for example, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, God speaking to the first man, Adam, and Eve, of course, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the earth. So, so here's the language of domain, the language of dominion. Now, a lot of people think that in Genesis 1 and 2, that the earth was Eden. But no, the earth wasn't Eden. Eden was just a small plot of land because the biblical story goes on and says the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So you have a plot of ground, you have a piece of land, and that piece of land is Eden, and God himself planted that garden and created and beautified the garden, and hence it was called Eden, which means pleasure. It was the garden of pleasure. And that's where he put the first man, the first woman in that garden. But having put them in that garden, this is a very interesting feature of the story. God said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to expand your borders. I want you to go out from Eden, and I want you to expand and expand and expand. There's a sense in which we could say that the whole earth was to become Edenized. It was to become beautiful through the stewardship of human beings. The vocation, the job of human beings was to expand beauty until the whole earth would, to use the words of Isaiah, blossom like a rose. Can you imagine? The whole world like Eden. That was the goal. In Genesis 3, chapter, chapter 3, verse 1, however, we have what we commonly refer to in the biblical storyline as the fall of mankind. Now, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now, if you fast forward in the story, you discover that this enigmatic being that is here, the serpent, is actually a fallen angel who is co-opting the body, if you will, of the serpent as a medium of deception. The serpent in the biblical narrative is none other than the devil, the fallen angel, Satan, and he is in this part of the story, he is engaging in a territorial land grab. The devil is taking from humanity the world, the earth, the planet, the territory God had given to them. So when you read through Genesis chapter 3, you discover that the fall of mankind involved a moral dimension. You could say that they fell morally. They became sinners in a moral sense. But it was also a governmental fall. In other words, God had given them dominion and they forfeited that dominion by giving it over to a foreign, invading, territorial land master who was coming into the world and claiming the earth as his own. So as the sin problem unfolds in Genesis 3, a part of the story that we often overlook is that the moral fall, the governmental fall, the territorial dispute resulted in Adam and Eve being expelled from a geographic location, from a territory. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 23, the Lord God sent him, that's Adam, out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So, so Adam was expelled from the geography that belonged to him by creation and by divine delegation. God delegated the garden and the world to him, and he was expelled. Now, C.S. Lewis pans way out. Just expand your vision. Get the aerial view for a minute here. C.S. Lewis pans way out from the Genesis narrative and says, hey, really this is bigger than Adam and Eve and just Eden. He says there is no neutral ground in the universe. No neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. We're engaged in a territorial dispute, a turf war of cosmic proportions. So Genesis chapter 12, which we looked at in our last time together, Genesis chapter 12 tells us that the Lord proceeded 
through a particular human being named Abram to engage in a territorial reclamation project. The plan of salvation involves a reclaiming of land, a reclaiming of the earth. So God said to Abram, get out of your country, your particular geographic location, your particular homeland, your culture, from your family and from your father's house, to the, notice, to a land that I will show you. This is chapter 12 of Genesis. Going on to verses 5 and 6, so they, this is now Abram and Sarai and, and Lot, his nephew, and their entire entourage. So they came to the land of Canaan, but check this out. And the Canaanites were then in the land. So God is promising them a land that is occupied by others. Track with me here. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. This land that is occupied, not by the Crips and the Bloods, but the Canaanites. The Canaanites are occupying the land, and God is saying, I'm going to expand your authority and your reach, and I'm going to give you this very land. And this is where we get the term that you no doubt are familiar with, the promised land. God promised to Abram and through Abram to the human race, I'm going to give you the land of planet Earth back. I'm going to take it out of satanic control and dominion, and I'm going to bring the world back under human dominion where it belongs. This is the promised land. So we come to Genesis chapter 13, and this is fascinating. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, they divided up and said, hey, I'll take this area, you take that area. Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, check this out, eastward and westward. For all the land which you see, I will give to you and your descendants forever. This is God reiterating in chapter 13, the promise. What's the promise? Abram, I'm giving you the land, but not just you, I'm giving you the land and all your descendants forever. Arise, this is interesting, in chapter 13, verse 7, arise, God says to Abraham, and walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. What's happening here? This is an extremely important legal process. I just received these books as a gift, and I am so delighted. Robert Alter is the foremost Hebrew scholar going today, and he has given us a translation of the Old Testament, specifically here, the first five books of the Bible, the five books of Moses. Robert Alter, commenting on this process, says, walking around the perimeter of a piece of property was a common legal ritual in the ancient Near East for taking possession. So when God says to Abram, hey, I want you to walk the length and breadth of the land. I want you to walk all over this land. God is saying, hey, I'm giving this to you, and you and I are entering into a legal contract. The world is coming back under human dominion. Now, it's interesting that later on in the biblical narrative, the same exact language is used by the devil himself. In Job chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, now there was a day when the sons of God, the representatives of other territories in God's vast universe, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came among them, among these sons of God. And the Lord said unto Satan, notice the language, from where do you come? Not what are you doing here? It's a point of origin question. What territory are you here purporting to represent in my heavenly counsel? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and walking back and forth on it. Robert Alter, the Hebrew scholar, would say to us that this is Satan laying claim to planet earth as his rightful legal domain. He's saying the earth is mine and I am the Lord of the human race, which brings us to Genesis chapter 14. Because in Genesis 14, we realize why it is that the Canaanites need to be expelled from the land of Canaan and why it is that God wants to give the land to Abram and his descendants. And it came to pass in the days of, and the dot, dot, dot here is a bunch of kings. 
They're all fighting. They made war with one another. 12 years they served Chedorlaomer, and in the 13th year they rebelled. So you have in chapter 14 of Genesis this war that is constantly ensuing between these various tribes, between these various kings and their followers. And they attacked all the country of the Amalekites and the Amorites, and this place is a bloody war zone. Canaan was a turf war underway constantly. And they went out and they joined themselves in battle, four kings against five. So Canaan is imploding with turf war. And it is into that particular situation that we find this very strange, mysterious being, this individual called Melchizedek, after Abram had intervened with his 300 or so warriors to rescue Lot, his nephew, who had been taken captive in the narrative, now Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of God, the Most High God. And he blessed him, that is, Melchizedek blessed Abram, and notice the blessing, Blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. God is now specifically introduced to us in the biblical narrative as the rightful possessor of heaven and all of earth. And God, exercising his authority, is in the process of giving the world back to humanity, beginning with Abram. Here with Melchizedek, we have a different kind of king who operates outside of the turf wars. Melchizedek is specifically called a king, but interestingly, he's also called a priest because he is a king of a different sort. He's not engaged in the warfare. Melchizedek blesses Abram by announcing that God is the possessor of heaven and earth, the implication being that something is underway in which God is reclaiming the world through Abram. So now fast forward in the biblical narrative, and a lot of stuff in the New Testament will start to make sense. With that little bit of background, we come to the New Testament, and Jesus comes to earth, and we normally think, oh, he came to the world to be our Savior, to forgive our sins so we can go to heaven. But Jesus came into this world for a very specific purpose. When he came to this world, notice he entered into a turf war. He entered into a battle, a controversy with the devil. The devil, then the devil taking him, that's Jesus, to a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment. Why is the devil stretching all the kingdoms of the world before Christ? A great panorama of kingdoms is before him. And all this authority, the devil says, I will give you, Jesus, and their glory for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Here is a part of the temptation of Christ by Satan that is referring back in the narrative, in the story, to the fall of Adam and Eve. The devil is essentially saying, I own planet Earth, it's mine, because the first owners or stewards over the earth gave it to me. And he's claiming, hey, I will give the world back to you if you acknowledge me as just one step above you as the rightful Lord of planet earth. Well, later on in chapter four, after this temptation occurs, this is fascinating. Jesus refuses the offer, and then he announces, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. Jesus specifically is defining his mission as a mission to advance the kingdom of God in the world by taking cities going in to physical locations where people live and proclaiming the kingdom of God. Whatever city you enter, he says to his disciples, notice he's sending them. He's deploying his disciples. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as they set before you, heal the sick, and then say to them, 
The kingdom of God has come near to you. This is all territorial language. Jesus is here to take back the world. Then the 70 of these followers of Jesus that were sent out preaching the kingdom of God returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. The kingdom of Satan is being overturned. It's being toppled by the ministry of Jesus. As they come and proclaim, Jesus follows up and he says, interestingly, in a little parable in chapter 11, Jesus says, okay, I'll tell you what's happening right now in my ministry. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and he divides the spoils. Jesus just told a little parable in which he represents Satan as the strong man who has taken control of the world. And Jesus says, but I'm here now and I'm stronger than he is and I'm taking the world back and I'm gonna divide the spoils to the human race. This is the great controversy. And then Jesus makes this rather military statement. He who is not with me is against me, he says. And he who does not gather with me scatters. This is strong language. Jesus is saying, listen, we need to go out and we need to bring people in. We need to spread the good news of this new kingdom that has come. The gospel commission is in fact an advancement of the claims of Christ to ownership of planet Earth. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth, Jesus says, on the premise of his death on the cross in Matthew 28. Go therefore, that is in the light of the authority that I have, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is essentially saying, I've gained the definitive victory over the kingdom of Satan. I've taken the world back into my possession, and now I'm in the process of redistributing the wealth of earth to my followers. It belongs to you. The gospel commission is a territorial reclamation project. That's what's happening in the biblical narrative. And the church is basically a benevolent gang <laughs> engaged in a turf war with the powers of darkness. I know you didn't come here today being expected, expecting to be told that you're a part of a gang. You're a part of a benevolent gang. There's territory to be claimed. There's turf that's disputed. And that turf falls into five basic categories. Your mind is a territory under dispute. Your body is a territory under dispute. Your city, this city, is a territory under dispute. And your world, my world, our world, is a territory under dispute. What I'm suggesting to you is that we exist here as a church for a reason. Planting a church in any location on earth constitutes a strategic territorial claim for the kingdom of God. Baptism is our initiation ceremony by which we pledge, as it were, allegiance to the new kingdom. And truth and love just happen to be our weapons of choice in advancing the kingdom of God. If you're a part of the church of Christ, you are engaged in a process of reclaiming turf, reclaiming territory for Jesus. Your mind, your body, your home, your city, the world belongs to him and has been purchased by the victory that he gained at Calvary. The question for you and me is, will we begin to imagine our lives, our homes, our city, and our world as the rightful possession of the God of the universe? And will we use our influence to advance his kingdom beyond the borders of 
this building in which we're sharing this time together this morning. There are people who are hungry to know the love of God. There are people who long to see what you have seen so that they can voluntarily choose to align themselves with the beautiful kingdom of Christ. We're engaged in a turf war and the Lord Jesus Christ is looking for members of his gang to take the gospel to the nations. Hey, thanks so much for watching. We hope that message was a blessing to you. God's word is powerful. It penetrates into our minds, into our hearts, brings about transformation in every aspect of our lives. Listen, we don't want you to miss any content. So again, we want to encourage you to click on subscribe and track with the content that's going to be coming out week after week. And if you'd like to partner with us in this global ministry of taking the gospel of Christ to the whole world, we want to invite you to become a partner in this ministry. Click give and join with us.